All right. So how many of you guys want to grow up and work with animals? <laughs> um, I always I know, right? When I get there, I'll let you know. Um, so I put this presentation on in, in 2020 for, for kids in the city that were looking for um, something to do during the pandemic. Um, to these like little talks about animals, and I wanted to inspire them to let them know what it was like to work with animals. But when I was a kid, there were only like three options. You could be a vet, you could be a farmer, or you could be a canine handler in the police department. That was it. Um, my dad's a cop. Uh, I definitely broke out of that mold. <laughs> I eat quinoa, and I'm a pacifist. There was no way I was going to be able to be a canine handler. Uh, farming was too much work, especially when I moved to the city. That wasn't something that I could do effectively. Um, and a veterinarian, I worked in, in animal hospitals for years. Um, working with animals in a medical capacity was never going to be something I was comfortable with. Um, some of my very best friends are vets, and I call them all the time, like, hey, this thing's broken, what do I do? But, <laughs> like, um, but I was never going to be a good candidate for being a vet. So I eventually stumbled into dog training, um, which became a more booming um, career later. Um, but there are so many more options that you can do that didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago. Um, you can be a snake venom milker and save lives. You catch venomous snakes, the difference between venomous and poisonous. Venomous, when they bite you, that's bad. Really bad in some cases. <laughs> um, and poisonous is if you eat something. If you were to eat something that makes you vomit, that would be poisonous. Um, so you can get these uh, snakes to bite into this specialized rubber thing, and then it pulls the venom out. You can now use that to make anti-venom for when people are bitten by snakes. And like the, <laughs> this is a big job in Australia, <laughs> where everything is trying to kill you. You can also uh, milk um, uh, funnel spiders in the same way. Um, if this isn't your bag. Totally get it. <laughs> Study penguins if you like the cold. Um, funny story, some of these researchers had discovered that penguin poop was, had a special kind of toxicity to it that made you high. Um, they, <laughs> they were studying these penguins for something else completely and realized they were getting loopy on penguin poop. They then discovered that it had like nitric oxide in it. <laughs> Oh, they felt funny and then had headaches. Um, so they made that discovery. It was not the discovery they went in for. It was the discovery they came away, away with. Um, but now all of these different jobs and opportunities exist that did not exist 20 years ago. Um, so if there's a field that you're interested in and you want to work with animals, it's actually harder to find a way not to combine those things. And we're going to talk about some of these today. Um, so what I usually tell young people especially is like, look at, for the things that you already like to do. So if you like to help people and animals, great. Like there are many jobs that we're going to cover several of them today. If you like wildlife versus domesticated animals, um, if you like to teach kids, I love teaching. Like I, I feel that was my calling and I really love my job. Hi guys, come on in. Um, if you like to dig in the dirt, you can use animals to do archaeological digs. Um, these dogs have recently, we're going to talk about them in a bit, found um, remains from 3,000 years ago in the mountains of Croatia. Um, if you like to perform and be the center of attention, hi, <laughs> also me, um, you, can, you can entertain. Um, but first, there's something very, very, very important that we have to talk about, and that's the entertainment industry when it comes to animals. Um, television, I think, is a great way to start to get inspiration for maybe working with animals. So like if you've seen training or veterinary stuff on TV. Um, but I can tell you from experience, good dog training is very boring. Like, it, that makes terrible television. <laughs> it's also kind of unrealistic, even though they tell you at the beginning that this is just for entertainment purposes. And this goes for a lot of vet shows as well. A lot of the care that you see in working with these people and their animals, there's a huge emotional burden that generally gets cut onto the cutting room floor um, that you don't see in these shows. Like they'll, they'll get the crying moment because that's a, that's a moment. But they're not going to like, the financial aspect of it, of working with these animals, like from the owner's perspective and the, the, the emotional weight that you take on as their caretaker 
it's a lot. Um, and that usually gets left on the cutting room floor, and it gives the illusion, even though they say at the beginning, we can't fix this in an hour, you still kind of walk away with, like, well, maybe two hours. <laughs> but there are lots of animals that, like, Roberta and I and some of the trainers here work with that it might take us years to get, to get them to a point where they might be able to walk into a strange room because they might be so traumatized or terrified. Um, so I think it's really, really, really important to use, like, TikTok, YouTube, TV for inspiration, but then go talk to real qualified professionals to see what that job is really like, because everything you see on TV is just going to be glorified for the entertainment value. Um, check your sources, and we are going to show you how to do that. Um, you can listen to some podcasts if you really like animals. I like the Varmints podcast. They have not been updating them recently, but they've got like 300 in the can. So if you just like to learn about silly animals, that's a really good show. Wow in the World is also good for kids. Just the Zoo of Us is good for all ages. Um, Bewilderbeast, that's the podcast I do where animals intersect with humans. So like, um, like horses that find missing people or like the Croatian bomb detection bee. So it's like a little bee that finds bombs in Croatia. Um, and then iNaturalist, if you like plants, animals, if you're like, hey, what's that bird sound? <laughs> like, you can make an app to help people identify what's that bird sound. So iNaturalist is a great free app if you just wanted to explore in your own backyard. So these are some things that you can look at. And also libraries are awesome. Go to your local library and find resources that way. Um, so many of these jobs I'm going to talk about today are regulated or that you would need certifications to do. Some are not, including my job. Um, I have an unre I'm an employee in an unregulated industry. And we're going to talk about what that's like. Um, you can also go to special school, like pony school, which I actually did. That's my college roommate. <laughs> Special colleges out there if you want to work with horses. And I attended and then got bucked off and decided, maybe, um, maybe I don't want to do this. <laughs> Hi there. Come on in. Hi. Oh, just go right on in. Um, so there are some jobs where you do need a higher education or that you'll benefit from a higher education. Um, you don't need to have a, co a collegiate education if you're going to ride horses. But Ruth really wanted to do um, teacher training and help people at the time coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan with PTSD and using horses in a therapeutic way. Um, and so that's her. And she is actually doing that right now. And she also works in fox hunting. Um, if you want to work with animals, advanced education can be very, very useful. My degree is in psychology. And when I was doing my degree, I'm like, I'm never going to use this. Like, because I fell off a horse. I'm like, well, now what do I do? I, I like this class. I guess I'll just stick with psychology. But I use it every day. Everything I do as a dog trainer is based in learning theory, which is basically psych 101 through 505. <laughs> Math, sciences, anatomy, veterinarians, and vet techs need to have a really good foundation in these um, fields. Equine sciences, well, if there's a horse school and you want to work with horses, that's a great place to figure it out, too. Some jobs aren't regulated, like I was talking about. This is me teaching a tricks class. I was trying to teach uh, these dogs to tell the difference between a flashlight and a book. And so like, we would tell them, flashlight, and the dog would touch the flashlight. And where's the book? And they put their nose on a book. Um, so we were trying, that's a, a skill called object discrimination. Um, dog training is currently an unregulated industry. Anybody could be a dog trainer. Um, and I think that that can be a very good thing. It's, very, it's not very gatekeeper-y. Um, <laughs> until very recently. <laughs> um, but also the, the downside to that is anybody who's ever looked at a dog can say that they're a dog trainer too and can have you pay them money and, and they can do a really bad job and then it's harder for us because now we have a lot more work to do. So you can start to look for things with like certifications. So like I have my certification is CPDT. I'm a certified pet dog trainer, professional dog trainer. Um, I had to sit for a four hour test on ethics, ethology, learning theory, um, some vet tech stuff, just in case a sick vomiting dog is coming in. I could say, that's probably not good. Get out of my classroom. Like, <laughs> but I am not a medical professional. I have no business saying if a dog is limping, that's his knee, that's his ankle put ice on it. My job is to recognize something is wrong and then say, go to your vet. <laughs> Definitely don't go on the internet and look for that guy to give you advice. Um, but you want to figure out which ones are, are reputable um, and which ones are better. Some are really philosophical and you have to do a lot of studying for, and some are more practical. So like some students 
would do better like doing all the book learning and some would do better doing the practical. So which one are you going to be more comfortable in if you're going through an unregulated industry and you still want to be ethical about it? Um, there are a lot more online programs now. Thank you, 2020. Um, <laughs> something good came out of that. There's a lot more online opportunities, which I think is way more accessible. Um, it's not the same as in person, but a lot of them also have in-person tracks. So you do the online course, and then you find somebody to shadow and work with. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Some jobs are very regulated. Who here before today wanted to be a vet? <laughs> like, who here after seeing this picture does no longer want to be a vet? <laughs> like, um, every vet student has to put their arm up the business end of a cow. Um, it's what you do. It's not a hazing ceremony for a fraternity. It really is to try to get a temperature and also to do an internal exam on these cows. Um, veterinarians, I think, have the hardest job in the animal industry. But again, that's usually the one that we generally think of first. Like, I want to work with animals. Oh, little Susie's going to be a vet. Maybe not. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, they are, when your dog is sick, they are your medical doctor. They are a pediatrician. They are a dentist. They are an orthopedic. They are because they're like, I don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> they're a boo-boo fixer and a cow up the bummer. Um, they have to do it all in a way that like, I wouldn't go to my pediatrician now. I'm in my 40s. <laughs> so now I have to find a special nutritionist. or a spe I definitely went to a different birthing coach. Um, so those are very regulated in, uh, a very regulated industry. You have to go to college and university to get your vet degree. Um, a certified applied animal behaviorist. So who here has heard of behaviorists or animal behaviorists? Yeah. So they're kind of like trainers in that I, uh, we work to affect behavior. A certified applied animal behaviorist, though, if you're looking for somebody who's reputable, you are looking for a master's degree. That is, um, so if somebody's saying, I'm a behaviorist, look for the degree, look for the credential. And the certified part says that you also took a test, not only that you have your master's degree in an animal, a PhD, sorry, a PhD in an animal related field, but that you also have a certification to work with pet animals. So you could have a zoology degree and you worked with bonobos. Does that make you qualified to help a Great Dane with separation anxiety? Probably not. <laughs> so that's what the certification is. So it's a certification on top of a PhD. And so I, if somebody has a strong animal behavior problem, look for that certified applied animal behaviorist, not some guy saying, I'm a behaviorist. They will always qualify it. So if you want to help animals and maybe work in medicine, this tends to, again, tend to be the gateway for people who are thinking of working with animals. Um, the, and you like working with people, you have a couple of different options. These are two of my best friends on the planet. This is Dr. Sipperstein. Um, this is a tortoise that <laughs> she's doing a little check on. This is his head. I don't know if you guys can see it. That's his little eyeball, his little nose. He's upside down. She's fixing his, she's um, stitching him up. She's got some sutures here. So he had cut his like little, oh, is it a paw? <laughs> a little foot appendage. This is my friend, Dr. Sam. Uh, and she was trying to take a picture of the patient to send. It'd be like, everything's cool. And it flew up on top of her head. <laughs> um, Sip especially, she does not work um, with cats and dogs. She only does exotic, uh, exotic animals. That's everything from hamsters, gerbils, birds, this guy. <laughs> she will see a dog or a cat in a pinch, or if you happen to be friends with her and you have a dog who's got a really weird problem. Um, but for the most part, she just works with exotics. So if you want to work with animals, you don't necessarily have to do dogs and cats. You can do some really cool stuff. But then you also have to know reptile anatomy, bird anatomy, hamster anatomy, like bearded dragon anatomy. Um, you have to know all of it. What can they eat? How's, how's their medication dose? Because you're also the anesthesiologist as well. Um, if you want to, um, again, work in this field, there's good and bad to it. Most people who are coming to you, if you're a veterinarian, have a problem. <laughs> their animal is sick, and those people are probably very upset because their animal is sick, or the cost is really high to get that animal care that it needs. Um, and sometimes it can be really hard to get what you need medically. If you live out in the middle of nowhere, and the only person who works with a specific type of doggy cancer is really far away, that's a big burden on that owner. 
And so having these conversations with your local vet can be really emotionally difficult. But you do get to see puppies and kittens coming in too for their distemper and their regular shots. So you do get that as well. But these vets have an emotional connection, not just to their people, but also to their patients, to, their, to the pets that come in. And again, I work closely with vets as a dog trainer, but I am not a vet and I am not qualified in any way to give any medical advice. Um, they do see some pretty gnarly things. Um, everybody's over the age of 10. That is a pyometra. That is, this is why we get spayed and neutered. Look, not we, pets. Um, that is an infected uterus. That should actually be about this size. Um, so that is them taking the infection, the infected uterus out. Um, it's a not uncommon. I'm not gonna say it's super common. You're not gonna like every unspayed female is going to have a pyometra, but if you hear the term pyometra, that's what that is. And then there's Sip with like her little guinea pig patients. Um, she really, really loves her some guineas. Um, if you like healing animals without putting your arm up the business end of a cow, and you like dry land. And you might not want to go and get your, your, your medical license as a vet. You can be a vet tech. And this is another uh, college friend of mine. This is also Melissa. Uh, she's a certified vet tech. So she is the doctor's nurse. She's the vet nurse. So she gets to help with anesthesia. She gets to help in surgery. She gets to help with people, write charts, um, vaccinate in some cases. I think in, I know Massachusetts. I don't know about Maine. Um, but they can give all the vaccines except for rabies. Um, they can patch up and do uh, bandage changes, stuff like that. They're also probably the person you're talking to on the phone when lab results come in, because the vet's busy. <laughs> um, so they can do dental work, x-rays, anesthesia, stuff like that. Um, you need to have science, a ton of patients, because you're working with people and animals that are maybe not at their best. Um, you're collaborating not only with your vet, but also with the public. So you're kind of the middle person, and you can educate the the public one-on-one. -on -one. So if you're not a big extroverted person, this might be a good option because you're really working one-on-one, -on -one, but you're working one-on-one -on -one in a lot of sequences as opposed to what I'm doing right now is one-on a lot. <laughs> um, so taking into account if you are more extroverted or introverted, that's something else to consider if you're going to work with animals as well. Um, if you like healing animals and thinking outside of the box and don't mind getting wet, you can actually be canine hydrotherapy and physiotherapy is a growing field. Um, I was going to put a picture of, um, of a team in Thailand who had tried to help this elephant whose foot got stuck in a trap. It was a little baby elephant. Foot stuck in a trap, but the pictures were, really weren't coming up. So I went to Twitter, and this is my friend Gemma, um, and she kind of works with pet dogs in the, in the pool. Um, but the elephant one was pretty cool too. So you can do domesticated animals or wild animals to help them get their strength back after surgery. Um, this is just part of a physical therapy plan. Like this isn't just all you do. You still have to work with your vet. <laughs> but this is like supportive care. Um, and you also, also see a lot of animals that have arthritis, older animals. So like they tend to be a little calmer. So you get to kind of get them in the pool and moving and stretching their bodies. Um, you have to know animal behavior and stress signals really well. Because if the animal you're working with starts to panic, you have to know the more subtle signs of panic before they're flailing and super panicked. Um, and again, you're working with veterinarians and trainers. And you can get a certificate or a certification in this as well. But if you want to work with animals, medical thing isn't for you. You'd rather solve puzzles. If you really like to set things on fire, <laughs> you can work in the arson uh, crime field. Um, this is Rex the fire dog. He's really popular on Twitter. Um, you need to have some animal training, whether you are the person training the animal um, and giving it to a fire department or the fireman who is charged with handling the dog. These dogs are trained to find um, uh, accelerant for arson cases. So after a fire, if it looks a little sus, they bring in the dog and the dog's like, that doesn't look great. <laughs> so they can smell of like kerosene or gasoline. They're trained on, I think, 50 different kinds of accelerant that you can use. Um, so uh, if you have an, en if you like engineering and solving problems, because like the structures of these fires, you have to have a, an engineering background. Um, and then also animal training and handling. Um, I talked to a couple of you guys before we were filing in. Um, this is a dog in Croatia finding 3,000-year-old bones. 
Um, we used to think that dogs could only see back in time with their noses a couple weeks. And then it turned out maybe a few years. This is 3,000 years. <laughs> um, they can sniff out so many things. Um, we know about search and rescue and cadaver dogs. Um, but there's also bed bug detection dogs. Um, so like if you see like the little beagles going into houses, if you guys really like beagles and don't mind never hearing anything over the din of howling beagles again, maybe you could be a beagle handler. Um, there's also conservation canines, which I think I have a couple specific ones in here. I think I have the whale. Um, but they can find endangered animals. So after these big fires in, in Australia, also 2020, not exactly the best year, um, Australia basically was entirely on fire. And after they had trained dogs to go find uh, rare trees that are only indigenous to Australia, and I think only a couple acres of these trees survived. So they sent the dogs out to go see if they could find the trees, and they found a few, so they were able to harvest some some of the specimens that way they could hopefully make more trees happen. I'm not a, I'm not a gardenologist. Um, <laughs> um, and they also had them finding koala, baby koalas and other endangered species. Um, so they also have uh, care for endangered animals. There are two, uh, what were they called? They're maremmas. They're giant dogs. They look like polar bears. They, uh, Great Pyrenees are, are another kind, but the maremmas tend to be more people social, so they use them instead. And they had taken these two dogs and put them on this tiny island called Little Island, <laughs> where there was a flock of penguins. They are the most endangered penguin in the world. At one point, there were only 10 on Little Island. And foxes at low tide would go out, eat the penguins, and come back. They put these two maremmas on the, on the island, Penguins started doing better. <laughs> so the maremmas took them in as if they were their flock and defended them. Again, and so the fox stopped coming. Um, so they were able to use these maremmas to save this critically endangered species of penguin. So if you want to work with wildlife especially, how many of you guys have heard of wildlife rehabilitation? Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Um, this is why, this specific job is why I have that disclaimer at the beginning. <laughs> if you see it on TikTok, it's great for inspiration, probably bad for work advice. Um, real rehabilitators um, have to be certified and licensed by the state. So you can't just go and get a beaver and put it in your house and say, I'm rehabilitating it. That's very illegal. Um, wild animals are wild animals. The intention is to always get them back out unless they are injured and can't be released, but the rehabber won't keep them. That animal will go to a sanctuary. Um, so there was one called, um, oh, what was the name of that beaver? Ace, do you remember the beaver? Be was it Beave the beaver? It was like a little baby beaver, and their instinct to make um, dams is really strong. So she'd come around, she'd be walking down her hallway, and there's like this little baby orphaned beaver just kind of beavering around her house, grabbing toilet plungers, forks, <laughs> dog toys, her shoes, a trumpet, and just like trying to dam up the area from the hallway to the bathroom. <laughs> She's like, hi, beef, try to step over his stuff, like, so she could pee. Um, and then like at about a year, they become super aggressive when they're male beavers because they want to find a mate. Um, she luckily had a little um, thing in her backyard, a uh, pond in her backyard, so she taught him how to make a dam, and then just one day he was gone. And then like she'd see him every now and again, and, but he was successfully rehabilitated. Um, so you have to know the ins and outs of the animals that you're rehabbing. Um, and this is a great job if you like biology, learning theory, and teaching. If you are curious about wildlife and really hate people, you could be a researcher. <laughs> so a lot of work in the research field, especially in animal behavior, zoology, stuff like that, is just sitting there observing and taking a lot of notes and doing a lot of study in that way. Yes, you still have to collaborate with your, um, with your mentors and stuff like that, but it's a much smaller group. So if you don't like doing what I'm doing now, or if you don't like people, <laughs> my kid's dancing over there, like, hey, it's me, um, <laughs> you can figure out what kind of research you like or what animal you like, and then just follow it like a creeper, take notes, and get paid for it. Um, so this person here was studying um, cheetah, which is pretty cool. Um, and if you just prefer working with one animal, you can follow that one animal for quite some time. 
Um, if you really like science classes, psychology and biology and research, if you really like to do a deep dive on something, this is an excellent job for you. If you like animals and the law, um, if, <laughs> right, if you are um, able to speak a second language, they need your help for undercover work to like shut down puppy mills. Um, and especially if you like the idea of working in rescue. Um, this is a hard job because you generally are seeing people at their worst and you see some of the worst things that have ever happened to animals. So it's, it's rewarding, but it, this is not an easy job. Um, you do get to help animals out of these bad situations. Sometimes helping them is having them humanely euthanized so that way they're not suffering. So I do like to prepare people if they do go into an industry like this that you're at least aware of each side of it. I don't want to paint any of these jobs with like a, a rose colored brush because they all do have their own difficulties. Um, you might see animal fighting rings hoarding, which I've walked into some hoarding cases as a dog trainer. It's not fun. Um, breeding facilities like puppy mills, but you can get them shut down. Um, and you get to work with police forces, law enforcement, and animal protection agencies. If seeing it in person is really hard, oh wait, uh, I'll go back to that other one. You can actually work in law. So you're not going on site necessarily of these fighting rings and stuff like that, but you can work in the legal field to get that stuff shut down. Um, and this woman, Joyce Tischler, is awesome. She's an animal rights lawyer out of the Bronx, I believe. Um, she loves animals, loves a good argument. So <laughs> kids who like to argue with their parents. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, if you like debate team, theater, public speaking, and you like animals, this might also be a really good field for you to consider. Um, forensic entomology, I always get these two words confused, entomology, bugs, etymology, language. <laughs> um, and I do find it funny that I always confuse the language part. Um, but forensics means crime solving. So you can use bugs to solve crimes. Does anybody know how you can do that? Oh, Ace has her hand written. Yeah, exactly. So like you can you can use bugs to figure out like their their part in the life cycle to figure out how long a cadaver has been there. For example, um, they have also been able to pull DNA from. Um, what was this case? I think it was in Denmark. Um, without getting too gruesome, it had to do with a hatchet. Um, and they were able to pick some ants, and they were able to extract DNA from the ants, and were able to track that DNA to the murderer. Um, so yeah, so you can, and if a body has been moved. So if there are bugs indigenous to the American Southwest, and you find a body in Minnesota, um, you're going to have different bugs. So like if you happen to really think gross bugs are cool, which I do, and you like solving puzzles, this is an excellent field. Um, you can make up animal birds? I don't know. So there's Joyce again. If you like to work with animals and teach, um, you can teach animals to do tricks on, in TV and in movies. Um, that's Toto. Um, I did this presentation for a Girl Scout troop, and they're like, who's Toto? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that was a bummer. Um, but if you like learning theory and you like performing, but not being in front of the camera, this is a cool way to do it. Um, this is Teresa Ann Miller. Um, she had a great um, segment on Terry Gross's Fresh Air, I want to say about four years ago about what it was like working with animals on sets. Um, and her dad used to be an animal trainer for Hollywood. And she would talk about like being a little kid and coming home, there'd be a seal in her bathtub. She's like, OK. Like, it was just normal. And it wasn't until she was an adult that she realized that was a really weird way to grow up. <laughs> um, if you want to work with animals, maybe even wildlife, and help wildlife, um, Ken Ramirez is an amazing instructor. Um, he used to be the um, head guy at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. Um, he has gone on to help um, animals, I want to say in the Congo. He taught these monkeys and chimpanzees how to tell 
um, law enforcement that poachers were coming. So he taught them when they see somebody approaching the fence to make this particular call, and that would alert law enforcement to come and handle the poachers, um, which is incredible. And he was, he's able to do this with all clicker training and positive reinforcement. Um, and as a trainer, I can say, if he can teach a, a monkey <laughs> to do that with positive reinforcement, I don't think we have any excuse to use pain to train a Shih Tzu. <laughs> like, um, Another epic thing that he did as far as training, these butterflies. Yes, Ace? So when there were caterpillars, well, the backstory was like this college university was having graduation, and they had these three colors for their school. So I like to use red, white, and blue because that's all I have in my head. So he, he only had like a week or two of, of the butterfly life cycle before they died. And you need a couple of months to train these caterpillars or these butterflies. So he's like, OK, what do I do? So he decided he was going to take these caterpillars, divide them. You, gr group A, are red butterflies. And they're going to go to a red target. So every time the red butterflies to be crawled over to the red target, they got something good. The same for the white, the same for the blue. They chrysalized. When they came out, he didn't know if this was going to work because <laughs> it was go time. They released the butterflies, and they had a trainer at each side of a football stadium with the color. And when the butterflies came out, the red went to the red, the blue went to the blue, the white went to the white. They do. So the way a butterfly chrysalizes, the caterpillar goes in, cocoons up, turns to goo, <laughs> and re recalculating, comes into a butterfly. So that was the first indication that we had that butterflies remember their whole body decomposing and recrystallizing as a beautiful butterfly. I know. That is the correct face to make. Yes. Um, so that's Ken Ramirez. Um, Teaching domesticated animals, people in public speaking. Hey, that's me. Um, I love giving presentations, especially if I get to inspire people to like think about ways that make them happy uh, working with animals. Um, I get to present to schools, museums, colleges, universities, all y'all, um, all y'all. Um, skills. I like science, but I just didn't want to. <laughs> um, my, one of my best friends is um, a pretty famous zoologist. And she's like, you're science adjacent. <laughs> and I thought that was perfect. I respect it. I just didn't have the, the brain to stick with it. Um, I love public speaking. And I can't argue that theater didn't help. Like, it definitely did. Um, I get to teach kids and parents about dogs and the cool things that they do. A week before the world shut down, I was at the Museum of Science in Boston, which was the highlight of my career, teaching people about dogs. My dog got to come with me, and she got to come and help. Um, they had this big dogs exhibit, um, and I got to go for three weekends to teach hundreds of people about what dogs' noses can find, and then the world shut down. So this was the last thing I got to do before a three-year hiatus, and it was awesome. <laughs> um, if you like books and you like animals, and you want to just be a librarian, you can actually just, like, depending on your town, get a cat to be a library cat <laughs> at the library. So I kind of felt like I should add this one. Um, there are about 200 library cats in the United States. Kennebunk Free Library will be the next. Um, they are going, my understanding is that they're going to be getting some kittens from us and fostering them there, and then people will have a second location to be able to look for kittens. Um, Dewey was the most famous. There's a book about him. It was really sad. He was, I mean, it worked out for him. The first two days were bad. After that, it was fine. Um, a librarian after Christmas in, I want to say, Iowa? It's one of the I states, Idaho or Iowa. Um, coldest night of the year, a librarian goes out the next morning and finds a kitten in the book drop. Um, so, of course, they have to name him Dewey, Dewey Decimal System, right? So he was Dewey Read More Books. <laughs> and he lived at the library. And kids who were afraid to read 
or were really shy, were able to read to Dewey and be able to like get some language skills and feel more confident about their reading. So he actually became a really great advocate for, well, mentor, uh, mascot, there, there's a word. <laughs> he wasn't advocating. Um, but he became kind of a mascot for uh, literacy in kids in the 80s and 90s. Um, and while cats won't judge your reading ability, they will still judge everything else because cats. <laughs> Um, there are all the other kind of animals that you might find in libraries as well. You have cats that were uh, able to get rid of moths and rats and stuff that would de uh, completely devour and destroy older books. But there are two libraries in Europe, I want to say one is in France, um, where they have bats that are kept in the library. And they are in these really old um, book areas. And they're like, well, the bats have kept the bugs away for this long. We're not going to evict, evict the, rat, uh, the bats. So they pull the, um, the shelves out. The bats all live underneath, behind the shelves. So every morning, they lift up a thing. I'm guessing the janitor has to handle that. <laughs> and then roll up uh, this drape cloth. People can look for books. And then at night, they pull the drape cloths off. The bats come out. They eat all the bugs. And this has been the most effective efficient and effective way of keeping their, um, their books um, pristine. And the, some of these books are hundreds to thousands of years old. So it's really, really cool what these bats can do. And they weren't trained. They were just there. <laughs> um, so how do you start working with animals? Well, be careful with the internet, like I said before. Make sure that whatever field you're going into, that you're looking for science-based information. Um, the internet can be a really good place until it's not, so you might find really bad advice. So I generally recommend look for the certifications first and then see if you can find people in that field who would be willing to talk with you. Um, and you want to make sure that they are not harming animals in any way. Um, what are your favorite subjects in school? If you like theater or science or math or history, these are all places that you could start to think, how can I use this with animals? And hopefully this inspired you or gave you some ideas to start looking outside the box. Um, and again, find somebody else in the line of work that you're looking at and ask a lot of questions. When I get assistants and interns in my classroom, they are shocked at how many times I have to say humping in front of a room of second graders and how many times a week I have that I get peed on. <laughs> it's not cute. <laughs> But I love my job, and so it's worth it. And then read a lot of books. The other end, if you like the idea of dog training or dog psychology, The Other End of the Leash by my friend Trisha, that's a book I wrote because there was no resource for living in the city with dogs. So my students were struggling. So after 15 years of working with dogs in Boston, I'm like, nobody else is going to write this, so I did. And then Canine Confidential, like, well, why do they do that? So find a book that's interesting to you and just read. And, and if you look in the resources, You'll find other authors that might be in the same vein that might also continue on that road to curiosity. What if my job doesn't exist? Oh, well, this is my friend Lily. Um, actually, Lily's pretty popular. Um, where's her poster? Is it? Yeah, we have one of her posters here. Um, Lily, and I'm not saying this to blow smoke, she's probably saved millions of dogs. Her art. Um, is on posters in animal hospitals. I use this kids and dogs poster to give to kids when I go into consultations all the time so people don't get bitten by their pet. Um, she was an illustrator for the WB network. Um, and then she ended up with a, a dog that was really struggling. Um, Boogie was the name of the Boston Terrier. Let's see if he's, oh, well, that Boston Terrier. Um, Boogie was really struggling. He bit her landlord at the bad day. So she found a dog trainer and was like, there are no resources out here that I can really understand. So she started drawing them. She was like, OK, wait, this is worry. This is what that looks like. So then she started talking with vet behaviorists. There was a really popular one named Sophia Yin. She sadly completed suicide in 2015. Um, but before that, the two of them worked together to put some of these posters together um, to, to help people understand their dogs better. Here is her book that she ended up writing. Uh, all on doggy language. Um, so you can see, like, is this dog happy or sad? And a lot of times, like, when I get Christmas cards of people hugging their dogs, the people look so happy, and the dog is like, I hate all of this. And, like, <laughs> and everyone's like, it's so cute. I'm like, 
your kid is adorable. Like, your poor dog is a hot mess. Um, so, like, being able to really read the dog, um, I think she's gone on and she has saved millions of dogs' lives from people not getting bitten by them and understanding their dog a little better. Um, so if your job doesn't exist, make it exist. Because that didn't happen until Lily stepped forward and was able to illustrate these dogs in a way that kids could understand, adults could understand, non-dog people could understand, and that I could use going into clients' houses and say, this is a resource for you. That, that was a lot harder before she came along. Um, so if you want to be a dog trainer where you grow up, speaking of hugging dogs, I'm also taking a bone from this one and laying on it. Um, not my best moment. Keep in mind, there is an adult taking this photo, but cute picture, right? Um, but I grew up to get to teach dogs to play Frisbee, write a book about living with dogs in cities. I got to help thousands of people in Metro Boston. Now I'm helping people here in Maine, um, where I grew up. I grew up with a sled dog team. It got me shoved into a lot of lockers when I was a kid, but it's really interesting now that I'm an adult. <laughs> um, so you can, you can work with animals. It just might take you a little longer to find your way, but the good news is that there's a lot of options out there because they just didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. Um, I always cite my resources, so here they are. Um, so if there's any of these that you want, or if you guys want a copy of this slideshow, I'm happy to send it to you. You can just put your email address up on that whiteboard, and I'll take a picture of it, and I'll send it off to you if you'd like. Um, and then this is my podcast, Bewilderbeasts. Um, and I tell all of these stories about animals at humanity. This one's one of my favorites. <laughs> it was uh, President Jackson's parrot who got kicked out of his funeral for swearing too much. Um, fire goats who are firefighters, they eat all the brush, so that way it stops the fuel. Um, they're really big in California. And cat butt science. That was a kid who did a, um, a science project. He wanted to know if long-haired cats or short-haired cats had their butts touch more surfaces. <laughs> So, without telling mom, took two colors lipstick. <laughs> he did data, guys. Um, and he won the science fair, and his mom won new lipstick. <laughs> um, so, yeah, these are, like, I just tell stories about animals, like real animals who have, have existed that have intersected with humanity. Um, so that's another thing. If you like to talk into a microphone, you can do that, too. Um, any questions? How many of you guys wanted to be a vet before you saw the cow arm up the butt? <laughs> How about after? <laughs> um, yeah, so there you go. I have um, stickers of the Croatian bomb detection bee if anybody would like one. Um, and I guess that's it. Thanks for coming, guys. And if you feel free to put your address on the back there, your email address if you want me to send you the slides so that way you guys have the resources. Um, I will also make sure, um, you can actually just search for Bewildebeast Podcast and you can email me there or you can email Roberta and she can get you guys in touch. Because um, I did forget to put my contact information there. That was smart. <laughs> i got to go back to presentation school. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys.